Chapter Three of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Her thus turning her back on me was fortunately not, for my just preoccupations, a snub that could check the growth of our mutual esteem. We met, after I had brought home little Miles, more intimately than ever on the ground of my stupefaction, my general emotion. So monstrous was I then ready to pronounce it that such a child as had now been revealed to me should be under an interdict. I was a little late on the scene, and I felt, as he stood wistfully looking out for me before the door of the inn at which the coach had put him down, that I had seen him on the instant without and within, in the great glow of freshness, the same positive fragrance of purity, in which I had, from the first moment, seen his little sister. He was incredibly beautiful, and Mrs. Groves had put her finger on it. Everything but a sort of passion of tenderness for him was swept away by his presence. What I then and there took him to my heart for was something divine, that I have never found to the same degree in any child, his indescribable little air of knowing nothing in the world but love. It would have been impossible to carry a bad name with a greater sweetness of innocence, and by the time I had got back to Bly with him, I remained merely bewildered, so far, that is, as I was not outraged, by the sense of the horrible letter locked up in my room in a drawer. As soon as I could compass a private word with Mrs. Groves, I declared to her that it was grotesque. She promptly understood me. "'You mean the cruel charge?' "'It doesn't live an instant. My dear woman, look at him!' She smiled at my pretension to have discovered his charm. "'I assure you, miss, I do nothing else. What will you say, then?' She immediately added. "'In answer to the letter?' I had made up my mind. "'Nothing.' "'And to his uncle?' I was incisive. "'Nothing.' "'And to the boy himself?' I was wonderful. "'Nothing.' She gave with her apron a great wipe to her mouth. "'Then I'll stand by you. We'll see it out.' "'We'll see it out,' I ardently echoed, giving her my hand to make it a vow. She held me there a moment, and then whisked her apron again with her detached hand. "'Would you mind, miss, if I used the freedom—to kiss me? No!' I took the good creature in my arms and after we had embraced like sisters, felt still more fortified and indignant. This, at all events, was for the time. A time so full, that, as I recall the way it went, it reminds me of all the art I now need to make it a little distinct. What I look back at with amazement is the situation I accepted. I had undertaken with my companion to see it out, and I was under a charm, apparently, that could smooth away the extent and the far and difficult connections of such an effort. I was lifted aloft on a great wave of infatuation and pity. I found it simple, in my ignorance, my confusion, and perhaps my conceit, to assume that I could deal with a boy whose education for the world was all on the point of beginning. I am unable even to remember at this day what proposal I framed for the end of his holidays, and the resumption of his studies. Lessons with me, indeed, that charming summer, we all had a theory that he was to have. But I now feel that, for weeks, the lessons must have been rather my own. I learned something, at first, certainly, that had not been one of the teachings of my small, smothered life learned to be amused, and even amusing, and not to think for the morrow. It was the first time, in a manner, that I had known space and air and freedom, all the music of summer, and all the mystery of nature. And then there was a consideration, and consideration was sweet. Oh, it was a trap! Not designed, but deep, to my imagination, to my delicacy, perhaps to my vanity, to whatever in me was most excitable. The best way to picture it all is to say that I was off my guard. 
They gave me so little trouble. They were of a gentleness so extraordinary. I used to speculate, but even this with a dim disconnectedness, as to how the rough future—for all futures are rough—would handle them and might bruise them. They had the bloom of health and happiness, and yet, as if I had been in charge of a pair of little grandees, of princes of the blood, for whom everything, to be right, would have to be enclosed and protected, the only form that in my fancy the after years could take for them was that of a romantic, a really royal extension of the garden and the park. It may be, of course, above all, that what suddenly broke into this gives the previous time a charm of stillness, that hush in which something gathers or crouches. The change was actually like the spring of a beast. In the first weeks the days were long. They, often at their finest, gave me what I used to call my own hour, the hour when, for my pupils, tea-time and bedtime having come and gone, I had, before my final retirement, a small interval alone. Much as I liked my companions, this hour was the thing in the day I liked most, and I liked it best of all when, as the light faded, or rather, I should say, the day lingered and the last calls of the last bird sounded in a flushed sky from the old trees, I could take a turn into the grounds, and enjoy almost with a sense of property that amused and flattered me, the beauty and dignity of the place. It was a pleasure at these moments to feel myself tranquil and justified, doubtless perhaps also to reflect that by my discretion, my quiet good sense and general high propriety, I was giving pleasure, if he ever thought of it, to the person to whose pressure I had responded. What I was doing was what he had earnestly hoped and directly asked of me, and that I could, after all, do it, proved even a greater joy than I had expected. I dare say I fancied myself, in short, a remarkable young woman, and took comfort in the faith that this would more publicly appear. Well, I needed to be remarkable, to offer a front to the remarkable things that presently gave their first sign. It was plump one afternoon, in the middle of my very hour. The children were tucked away, and I had come out for my stroll. One of the thoughts that, as I don't in the least shrink now from noting, used to be with me in these wanderings, was that it would be as charming as a charming story suddenly to meet some one. Some one would appear there at the turn of a path, and would stand before me and smile and approve. I didn't ask more than that. I only asked that he should know, and the only way to be sure he knew would be to see it, and the kind light of it in his handsome face. That was exactly present to me, by which I mean the face was, when on the first of these occasions at the end of a long June day, I stopped short on emerging from one of the plantations and coming into view of the house. What arrested me on the spot, and with a shock much greater than any vision had allowed for, was the sense that my imagination had, in a flash, turned real. He did stand there. But high up, beyond the lawn, and at the very top of the tower, which, on that first morning, little Flora had conducted me to. This tower was one of a pair, square, incongruous, crenellated structures, that were distinguished for some reason, though I could see little difference, as the new and the old. They flanked opposite ends of the house, and were probably architectural absurdities, redeemed in a measure indeed by not being wholly disengaged, nor of a height too pretentious, dating, in their gingerbread antiquity, from a romantic revival that was already a respectable past. I admired them, had fancies about them, for we could all profit in a degree, especially when they loomed through the dusk, by the grandeur of their actual battlements. Yet it was not at such an elevation that the figure I had so often invoked seemed most in place. It produced in me this figure, in the queer twilight, I remember, two distinct gasps of emotion, which were sharply the shock of my first and that of my second surprise. My second was a violent perception of the mistake of my first. The man who had met my eyes was not the person I had precipitately supposed. 
there came to me thus a bewilderment of vision, of which after these years there is no living view that I can hope to give. An unknown man in a lonely place is a permitted object of fear to a young woman privately bred, and the figure that faced me was, a few more seconds assured me, as little any one else I knew as it was the image that had been in my mind. I had not seen it in Harley Street, I had not seen it anywhere. The place, moreover, in the strangest way in the world, had on the instant, and by the very fact of its appearance, become a solitude. To me at least, making my statement here with a deliberation with which I have never made it, the whole feeling of the moment returns. It was as if, while I took in, what I did take in, all the rest of the scene had been stricken with death. I can hear again as I write the intense hush in which the sounds of evening dropped. The rooks stopped cawing in the golden sky, and the friendly hour lost for the minute all its voice. But there was no other change in nature, unless indeed it were a change that I saw with a stranger sharpness. The gold was still in the sky, the clearness in the air, and the man who looked at me over the battlements was as definite as a picture in a frame. That's how I thought, with extraordinary quickness, of each person that he might have been, and that he was not. We were confronted across our distance quite long enough for me to ask myself with intensity who then he was, and to feel, as an effect of my inability to say, a wonder that in a few instants became more intense. The great question, or one of these, is afterward, I know, with regard to certain matters, the question of how long they have lasted. Well, this matter of mine, think what you will of it, lasted while I caught it a dozen possibilities, none of which made a difference for the better, that I could see in their having been in the house, and for how long, above all, a person of whom I was in ignorance. It lasted while I just bridled a little with the sense that my office demanded that there should be no such ignorance, and no such person. It lasted while this visitant, at all events, and there was a touch of the strange freedom, as I remember, in the sign of familiarity of his wearing no hat, seemed to fix me from his position with just the question, just the scrutiny through the fading light, that his own presence provoked. We were too far apart to call to each other, but there was a moment at which, at shorter range, some challenge between us, breaking the hush, would have been the right result of our straight mutual stare. He was in one of the angles, the one away from the house, very erect, as it struck me, and with both hands on the ledge. So I saw him as I see the letters I form on this page, then exactly after a minute, as if to add to the spectacle, he slowly changed his place passed, looking at me hard all the while, to the opposite corner of the platform. Yes, I had the sharpest sense that during this transit he never took his eyes from me, and I can see at this moment the way his hand, as he went, passed from one of the crenellations to the next. He stopped at the next corner, but less long, and even as he turned away, still markedly fixed me. He turned away. That was all I knew. End of chapter 3